see, uh, we want to see how this ends. So we, we've seen New Jerusalem. We're finished with New Jerusalem at this point. Uh, we've seen the new heaven, the new earth. And now we're really into uh, God ending the book. And so how is he going to end this, this magnificent book that we've been going through? And it starts in verse 8. And look what happens here. Now I, John, saw and heard these things. And when I heard and saw, I fell down to worship before the feet of the angel who showed me these things. Then he said to me, See that you do not do that, for I am your fellow servant and of your brethren the prophets and of those who keep the words of this book. Worship God. And so what we see here is we see a few things. First thing we see is we see John declaring who he is. This is the first time we've seen John say, I, John, or let people know that he is John. This is the first time we've seen this uh, since way back in chapter 1 of the book of Revelation. So we saw it way back then uh, that he declared who he was. But then we see him do something again. This is the second time we see this. But we see him here, we see him overcome by what he had seen and heard and that he fell down to worship. So here's what I want you to understand about this when I say see what he's he's, uh, seen and heard. So we have been looking at the book of Revelation for over a year now. So we've been studying this, looking at this for over a year. I don't know how long to tell you John was writing the book of Revelation, how long it took him to see these visions and write all this down. But, but we have to think that he was probably seeing these visions pretty quickly and writing it down. And so we're seeing this over a year's period of time. Let's just say John saw all of this in like a couple of weeks or a few weeks. And then all of a sudden he started, you know, he's seeing this. So he's seen everything just really quickly of what we've studied for over a year. And he's been overcome. And he was overcome by everything that he saw, everything that he's heard, and he began to worship right then. Now, worship was what he should have done. After he sees these things, as we read the book of Revelation, we should be worshiping too. But the problem is, is he directed his worship to the angel and not to God. He directed his worship in the wrong place. And the angel reminded him of this very quickly. The angel told him, he says, and I fell at his, uh, I'm sorry, Angel told him, he said, I am your fellow servant and of your brethren, the prophets, and those who keep the worship of his, words of his book. Worship God. He said, don't worship me, is what the angel was saying. Don't fall down and worship me. He was like, worship God. We've seen John do this again before in verse chapter 19. It says, and I fell at his feet to worship him, but he said to me, see that you do not do that. I am your fellow servant and of your brethren who have the testimony of Jesus. Worship God. So twice, in, once in 19 and once in 22, we see John get so caught up in the moment that he worships the angel that is there before him instead of God. And both times, the angel, because an angel is not to be worshipped, the Bible tells us that, angels are not to be worshipped, the angel looks at him and the angel makes it very clear. You are to worship God. Not me, worship God. In chapter 19... And in chapter 22, in both places, he makes it very clear to him, worship God. This is for all of us today. Our focus of worship should always be God. Shouldn't be man, shouldn't be an angel, shouldn't be anything else but God. And God's commandment is for us to worship him and worship him alone. So we see John declaring who he is, and we see John uh, telling us these things, and we see, see him doing a, a worshiping this angel. But then all of a sudden, we see a proclamation, I guess. The proclamation comes later, but we see this, uh, this uh, commandment come down. Look, look what John says here in verse 10. And he said to me, Do not seal the words of the prophecy of this book, for the time is at hand. He who is unjust, let him be unjust still. He who is filthy, let him be filthy still. He who is righteous, let him be righteous still. He who is holy, let him be holy still. And behold, I am coming quickly, and my reward is with me to give to everyone according to his work. 
And so we go back here and we see all of a sudden uh, a change. We see uh, we're, we're going from everything that we've learned, everything we've seen, and now God is telling John some instructions and he's giving us some, some warnings in a way. He, he's telling us what to do and how to, how to handle the book of Revelation. So we're going to just look at these three verses and see what we can learn from them. The first thing that we learn here is that Revelation is to be studied and taught. Do not seal the words of this prophecy of this book for the time is at hand. He's telling John, everything you've written, everything that you've done, everything that you've seen, everything you've heard, write it all down. Don't seal it up. Don't make it a mystery. Don't hide it somewhere. He's telling John, he said, it needs to be out to the public. It needs to go out to these churches. And so do not seal the words. Revelation is a book that is to be studied, is a book that is to be taught, and is a book that God intended us to understand. And you may look at me and say, well, we spent a year studying this and it's still hard to understand some of these things. Well, what God wants us to do is He wants us to study it. He wants us to put our faith in Him. He wants us to, to pray about it. And He wants to teach us through the Holy Spirit. And so He was telling John, do not seal these words. Do not seal the words of this prophecy. Do not make them a mystery. Give them to the world because it is something that is to be taught. And the reason it is to be taught is that the last line here, for the time is at hand, for the time is at hand. He's telling John, he's like, we need to be ready. We need to be a generation, every generation needs to be ready for the return of Christ. Now we're going to get into the return of Christ in just a few minutes about the timing. But he's looking at John, he's like, don't seal this up. Share it with the world because they don't know when the time is. The time could be any moment now, so the time is at hand. So let them understand what you've seen. Let them understand what you've heard. Let them know. Let them come and know. And then we get into a very confusing verse. I'm going to admit that. Verse 11. Verse 11. He who is unjust, let him be unjust still. He who is filthy, let him be filthy still. He who is righteous, let him be righteous still. And he who is holy, let him be holy still. So when we first look at this, we're, we're like, well, what is he talking about? Why is he telling the unjust to be unjust? And why is he telling the filthy to still be filthy? It's like there is no salvation for them. And, and I don't believe that's what he's talking about. So there's a couple of different ways you can interpret this verse in my opinion. First, this verse could mean that time is so short that those who are unjust and those who are filthy will have no time to change. They've lingered too long. That's what these verses could mean. Because if you go back to verse 10, he's telling him, do not seal the words of the prophecy for the time, for the time is at hand. And then he immediately goes into this saying about he who is unjust will still be unjust. So it could be that he's saying that, that those who are righteous and holy will still be righteous and holy because they've already accepted Jesus Christ. But there's, the time is when the time comes, it's going to be too late for them to, those that are unjust or those who are filthy, to, to find righteousness. So it's going to be such a quick turnaround. God's going to come so fast that people are going to be caught unaware and they're going to be saying, wait a second. I wanted, to be, I wanted to follow Jesus. I want to be righteous. I want to be holy. But they waited too long. So that's one interpretation that you could look at this. If you go back to verse 10. For the time is at hand, so he who is unjust, he will be unjust still. You could look at it that way. Second, it could be that this is just a warning that your heart, the hearts of men, could be hardened toward the Lord and they refuse to turn away. It could be like we've seen in every generation that people's response to the gospel is negative and they don't want Jesus Christ and they don't want God. And so their hearts will still be unjust and still be filthy. If you hear the truth and continue to ignore it and do wrong, then you will remain unjust and filthy. That could be what it's talking about here. Me personally, I believe it's the first one, the first kind of option you can have in that we never know when the time is going to come. And so... To me, the bottom line of verse 11 is this. Don't assume that there will be time for a last-minute repentance because that trumpet could sound any moment now and there wouldn't be time for a last-minute repentance. And so I believe that's what the bottom line tells us. And so we see here in verse 12, he says, And behold, I am coming quickly. So that kind of backs up what I said about verse 11, talking about not having time. Behold, I'm coming quickly. Jesus Christ 
is going to come in a blink of an eye when he comes back. And he was warning the people in the last part of Revelation. He's giving them another chance. He's saying, hey, I'll be coming quickly. But then the last thing he tells us is this. There is a reward when he comes back. And my reward is with me to give to everyone according to his work. Only Christ can give us these rewards. Only Christ can come. These rewards are only to those who serve Him. They are only those who have served Him, who have called out Him for salvation. And these rewards are only going to be given to us once we get to heaven. We will be rewarded for our service. And so we see Him showing us here, look, I'm coming back quickly, but when I come back, there's going to be a great reward. We always talk about the hope that we have and the things to look forward to. Well, one other thing to look forward to here is the great reward of this reward that Jesus Christ is going to give to everyone according to his work. And so we're going to see these rewards as we get up into heaven. And so knowing that Christ will return should should help us. And and if you look at verse 10, 11, and 12, it makes me think this. Many people see the the book of Revelation as a a, a book of doom and gloom because it talks about all the the wrath of God and all the the demons that come out and the Antichrist returning and are coming and ruling the world. And we think of Revelation as a doom and gloom book. But what Revelation really is is about the glory of Jesus Christ returning and so it should be a a book of hope, a book of assurance for us. It should be a a, a book that instead of makes us look at the doom and gloom, it should make us look look up in the sky wanting Jesus Christ to come back and waiting anxiously for Him to come back. But it should also be a book that makes us go and proclaim the gospel message so that others will hear and others will see what Jesus Christ is and what he's going to do. Which brings us to verse 13. We see the proclamation about Jesus Christ. Look what he says. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, the first and the last. Blessed are those who do his commandments that they may have the right to the tree of life and may enter through the gates into the city. But outside are dogs and sorcerers and sexually immoral and murderers and idolaters and whoever loves and practices a lie. And so we see this proclamation from Jesus Christ here. And we hear these words all the time, but do we really think about what they mean and what they're saying? He says, I am the Alpha and the Omega, and the beginning and the end, the first and the last. Well, Alpha and Omega... People are like, well, that's beginning and end, but how do we know that's the beginning and the end? Well, they use that term in, in Jesus' day, Alpha and Omega, as the beginning and the end because Alpha is the first letter of the Greek alphabet and Omega is the last letter of the Greek alphabet. And so if you said you were the Alpha and the Omega to, to the people in those days that spoke Greek, they would understand that would be saying you're the beginning and the end. And then Jesus went on to make it even clearer. I am not only the Alpha and the Omega, but I am the beginning and the end. And then he said, if you don't understand that part, let me tell it to you another way. I am the first and I am the last. And so, three different ways he described himself as the first and the last, beginning and the end, Alpha and Omega. What he was wanting to get across to everyone is this. Jesus Christ is eternal. He is forever, the first and the last, the beginning and the end. He is God, is what he's telling us. He was saying, I am not just the beginning and the end. I am God. Look at some verses that back this up. Revelation chapter 1 verse 8. Jesus speaking once again. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, says the Lord, who is and who was and who is to come, the Almighty. So there's Jesus once again telling us, beginning and the end, who is, who was, and who is to come, eternal. He is God. And then in Isaiah 44, 6, Thus says the Lord, the King of Israel, and His Redeemer, the Lord of hosts, I am the first, I am the last, besides me there is no God. And so we see God in other parts of the Bible telling us this. He's telling us, I am eternal. I am God, Jesus Christ. So when we see Alpha and Omega, we call Him the Alpha and Omega. We call Him the beginning or the end. Why do we call Him that? We're calling Him that because He is forever. He is eternal. But most importantly, we call Him that because He is God. He is God. He's not a false God. He's not some made-up God. He is God. He is God. And He has every 
attribute of God there is, Jesus Christ does. And so that's why we know that who he is there. And then he goes on to tell us, if we go back here, he goes on to tell us, okay, he says, I'm God, I'm beginning, the end, Alpha and Omega, I'm all these things. And then he tells us that those who are saved will have certain privileges. Verse 14, and we're going to study uh, the, these blessed statements in a couple of weeks. So if you go through the book of Revelation from the beginning to end, there's seven times that Jesus Christ says, blessed are those, kind of like back in the Sermon on the Mount when we have blessed are those. In Revelation, there's seven blessed are those. This is the last one. Blessed are those who do his commandments that they may have the right to the tree of life and may enter through the gates into the city. So these are the privileges... These are, these are the privileges of those who have called out to Jesus Christ for salvation. This is one of the privileges they will have. And he says that the privilege they will have is the right to the tree of life. So they will have the ability to eat of the tree of life or to be able to go to the tree of life that will give eternal life there. We talked about that tree last week. And you may enter through the gates into the city. And so only those who are saved may enter into the gates in the city of New Jerusalem. So as we've talked about for the last few weeks, New Jerusalem will only have righteousness inside of it. Now, what I don't believe is I don't believe that if you step outside the gates, you lose all righteousness or there will be unrighteous people outside of the gates. I, I believe this new heaven and this new earth and new Jerusalem are all going to be one and it's going to be nothing but righteousness there because the Bible tells us that everybody else has been thrown into the lake of fire, unfortunately. And so these are, this is a privilege that we have. But then he says, those that do not, look at what happens. But outside are dogs and sorcerers and sexually immoral and murderers and idolaters and whoever loves and practices a lie. Now once again, I do not believe that we should look at this and think that as soon as you walk outside the gate, you're going to have the lake of fire right there that you can look down upon and see all these people there. I don't believe that. Because hell, the lake of fire that, that, we th that they're thrown into, the Bible describes it as a place that God is not. It's the absence of God. It's being away from God. And the one thing we've learned about New Jerusalem is that God is in New Jerusalem. But the second thing we learned about New Jerusalem is everything is transparent. Everything is transparent and God's glory shines inside and outside the city. And so if you walked outside the city and the lake of fire was there, but God's glory was shining through the city into the lake of fire, God's presence would be there. And so I don't believe that when it says outside are dogs and sorcerers, I believe what it's telling us here is it's trying to teach us that the, the eternal resting place of those that do not follow Jesus Christ is going to be away from God on the outside of where God is at is what I believe it's teaching us. And then it tells us who, they're, who they are. Now, some people look at this and they're not for sure how to take this first word, but outside are dogs. This does not mean the animal dogs. In John's day, dogs were not domesticated. They were not trained. They were scavengers. And in those days, to call a person a dog was to call them someone of low character, like a sinner. And so when this is said, but, but outside are dogs, you could almost look at, but outside are the sinners or the low people. They would call a tax collector a dog. As a matter of fact, tax collector may be uh, too low to be called a dog. That's how they look at tax collectors. But that's what he means here. And then you've got sorcerers, those who engage in false religion and occult practices, sexually immoral people. This covers all sexual sins, murderers, unjust killings, idolaters, worshiping other gods. Everyone, uh, whoever loves and practices a lie, those who disturb the peace because of the lies. Basically, he's basically saying that encompasses everybody else. It's what it was. And what he's talking about here is he's not talking about people that have stumbled and fallen into these sins once or twice. What he's talking about here is he's talking about people who habitually follow these sins and have never turned their life over to Jesus Christ. And because of that, they will be on the outside looking in, in a way. And then he gives an invitation in verse 16. I, Jesus, have sent my angel to testify to you these things in the churches. I am the root and the offspring of David, the bright and morning star. And the spirit and the bride say, Come, and let him who hears say, come. 
and let him who thirsts come. Whoever desires, let him take the water of life freely. And so this is Jesus' final invitation in the Bible. Not in life, because by the time Jesus said this, it's too late to come to know him as Savior in the Bible. This is his final invitation for everyone to come to him. And once again, he wants to show us that he is eternal and he is God. Because he says, I am the root and the offspring of David. Well, to be the root of David, you have to be an ancestor. So you have to be before David. To be the offspring of David, that means that you are a descendant of David, which means you are after David. So to be the root and the, and, and the offspring, to be the ancestor and the descendant of David, you would have to have deity. You'd have to be eternal before David and after David. And so he's telling us here, I am eternal once again. He's eternal once again. And then he calls himself the bright and morning star. This is a word in those days that would be used as a god to show that someone is a god. Someone that, would to, that was worthy to be worshipped is what it says. And then in verse 16, I mean 17, he gives them an invitation. Come. The Spirit and the bride say, come. And let him who hears say, come. Jesus Christ is saying, come to me. And then he says this, and let him who thirsts come. Whoever desires, let him take the water of life freely. Verse 17 is really a verse of hope. Verse 17 is really a verse of hope. Come drink of the water freely, free at no cost to you. If you want Jesus Christ, come. Here's what one person said about this. He said, you can look at this verse and if someone says, I don't understand the Christian doctrine and theology. Verse 17 says, come anyway, because it doesn't say whoever understands Jesus, let him come. It says, whoever wants, let him come. It doesn't say that, you know, you may say, I can't repent the way I should. My heart is hard. I can't weep over my sins or feel bad over them as I should. But the Bible says, come anyway. Come and let Jesus take care of those things. Someone might say, I don't know if I can live the Christian life the way I should. Come anyway, because the verse doesn't say, come only if you can live a certain way. It says, come freely to Jesus Christ. And so this verse really is telling us this. If you desire Christ for salvation, come. That's what this verse is telling us. Come to Him for salvation. If you desire salvation in Him, come freely. Come to Him. He will give it to you. Whoever desires, let Him take the water of life freely. Come to Jesus Christ freely. That is His final invitation in the Bible. His final invitation to all of us in the world today is come freely to Jesus for salvation. Because then he follows it up with a warning. So if you want Jesus Christ, come freely. But then he follows it up for, as a warning in verse 18. For I testify to everyone who hears the words of the prophecy of this book. If anyone adds to these things, God will add to him the plagues that are written in this book. And if anyone takes away from the words of the prophecy of this book, God shall take away his part from the book of life, from the holy city, and from the things which are written in this book. Here's what God is saying. Here's why he's looking at us and saying. He's saying there is nothing left to be added to the book of Revelation. There is nothing to be taken away from the book of Revelation. Why would he warn us that? He warns us of that because man wants to add his own interpretation into it. And also man wants to take away from it so that he can make it the way he wants it to be. But a lot of people will quote this verse here and say that, well, it's not just about Revelation, it's about the whole Bible. You've ever heard this verse quoted about the whole Bible? Well, in some ways I can say, yes, it's about the whole Bible. But in a lot of ways I can tell you that it pretty much plainly says here, the words of the prophecy of this book, Revelation. But let me show you what God says about the rest of the Bible. Deuteronomy 4.2 You shall not add to the word which I command you, nor take from it, that you may keep the commandments of the Lord your God, which I command to you. Any word God gave to his people, he said, do not add, nor take away from it. That's not just talking about Revelation there. Deuteronomy 12, 32. Whatever I command you, be careful to observe it. You shall not add to it, nor take away from it. 
Proverbs 30, verse 5 and 6. Every word of God is pure. He is a shield to those who put their trust in Him. Do not add to His words, lest He rebuke you and you be found a liar. God has told us plainly, Revelation and the rest of the Bible, don't add to it, don't take away from it. But what we see since the Word has come in is we've seen man say, you know, I don't really want to live my life that way, but I want people to think I follow God. So why am I going to do? I'm just going to add a little word here, add a little bit there, I'll take away a little bit here, take a little bit there, have my own version of the Bible, and then I can do what I want to do and still say that I'm a Christian. And that's what men do and have done since we've had the Word of God through time. And so God gave them great warnings, and the consequences were not very good. The plagues mentioned in Revelation will come upon them. Now, I'm not going to go through all the plagues in Revelation, but they were not pretty, okay? You don't want those in your life. But the worst one is this. You'll be taken out of the book of life. You know what that means? It means you'll be cast in the lake of fire. That's what that means. And so what God is saying is these false religions that want to trick people, they want to make up their own Bible. And there's a lot of them that do that. He's saying... Don't fall and don't do that because there's consequences for you. And here's why there's so many consequences. And this is why being a pastor, I feel, has a great responsibility. Because I'm up here every week, Sunday, Wednesday, and any other time I get an opportunity, and I'm telling you about God. If I'm telling you a lie and I'm leading you astray, the Bible says that my punishment for leading you astray and telling you lies on purpose is far worse than those that don't. And so it is a great responsibility to make sure that everything that, that a preacher or a pastor says is the truth. But what happens is so many want power and money and prestige and all these things that they're going to tweak and add and make it, and they lead people astray by telling them lies. It may not look like it's a lie because, you know, the Bible may say or the Bible may or... Don't trust what the Bible says, they may tell you. Or you don't necessarily have to believe every word of the Bible. But God is making it plain here what will happen. And they're leading people astray. And they're leading people into that lake of fire. And because of that, the punishment will be great. So, he ends with that part with a warning. But then the very end of the Bible. The very, very end. Verse 20 and 21. He who testifies to these things says... Surely I am coming quickly. Amen. Even so, come, Lord Jesus. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Amen. What a way to end it. Jesus says, I am coming quickly. I am coming quickly. Even so, come, Lord Jesus. This should be our prayer. Even so, come. You can't come fast enough, basically, is what he's saying there. You can't come fast enough. He's telling us, I'm coming, I'm coming quickly. And John's like, come on, come faster. You know, that's the way it should be. Come, Jesus Christ. He will return quickly. But here's the thing. Here's the thing. It's going to be in God's time, not our time. Because I know you've heard it. We've all probably heard it before. We've heard these things before. Well, they've been saying that Jesus Christ is going to come back for 2,000 years now. And if he says he's coming quickly, that's not very quickly, right? Let me read you what Peter says. I know these are a lot of verses, but let me read you ver verses 1 through 10 of 2 Peter 3. Look at what he says. Beloved, I now write to you the second epistle, in both of which I stir up your pure minds by way of reminder, that you may be mindful of the words which were spoken before by the holy prophets and of the commandments of us, the apostles of the Lord and Savior. Knowing this first, that scoffers will come in the last days walking according to their own lust, and saying, Where is the promise of his coming? For since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of creation. For this they, will, they willfully forget, that by the word of God the heavens were old, and the earth standing out of water and in the water, by which the world that then existed perished, being flooded with water. But the heavens and the earth, which are now preserved by the same word, are reserved for fire until the day of judgment and the perdition of ungodly men. But, beloved, do not forget this one thing, that with the Lord one day is as a thousand years and a thousand years as one day. 
The Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some count slackness, but is long suffering toward us, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. But the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night, in which the heavens will pass away with a great noise, and the elements will melt with fervent heat. Both the earth and the works that are in it will be burned up. God told Peter, this is what's going to happen. People are going to come, and they're going to say, hey, all this stuff you said is going to happen quickly. It hasn't happened in thousands of years. Why are you still, why are you still worried about this? Why are you still believing in God? Why do you still believe all these things? And so God understood this, and so he sent Peter, he sent Peter these words, and he told Peter a couple of things. He said, don't forget that scoffers will come and they will say these things, but they're walking according to their own lust or desires, the way they want to act. And then he told them, he said, don't forget that, you know, one day for God is like a thousand years, and a thousand years for God is for one day. But verse 9 is the reason that we look at this and say, you know, you probably don't want God to come back too quickly. Because look at what verse 9 says, and then we'll close tonight. The Lord is not slack concerning His promise, as some count slackness, but is long-suffering toward us, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. The reason God has not come back yet, and the reason He has not sent Jesus Christ back, is because God is long-suffering toward us as sinners. Okay? The reason why revelation hasn't come true yet is because God is a loving God that doesn't want to see any of us perish. Even though He knows that the world is full of rebellion against Him, He's still holding back and holding back so that all that can can come to know Him as Lord and Savior. Which brings me to the last statement about revelation. Revelation is a book, as I said earlier, that should give us hope. And here's why. And I wrote this on your note sheet. We are not to live in fear of what is to come. We are to live in a life full of hope because of who is to come. That's what Revelation is about. Revelation is not, not about us living in fear because of what we saw coming. And those were disastrous, horrible things that we saw coming. But Revelation is a book that allows us to live in hope because of who? Jesus Christ. Who is coming back? That should give us hope. So Revelation is not this book of doom and gloom and, and all of these things if you know Jesus Christ. Now, if you're lost without Jesus Christ, it is. It's the worst book in the Bible for you if you're lost. I hate to laugh when I say that, but it is. It's the worst book. Why? Because it shows you without a doubt where you're going to end up. But it also tells you at the very end, if you're reading it, come freely. Come. Come to Jesus Christ. And so Revelation ends with an invitation and with hope is the way it ends. And so that should give us hope and that should get us to go out and tell others about this hope that we have. And so Revelation may not end the way you thought it ended, and I hope that Revelation now looks to you as a, diff as a different book than when we started this study. So we have gone through the book of Revelation. We've gone through all the end time prophecy that I could pull out of the Bible to show you guys over a, a, a year or longer. So the next two weeks we're going to look at these blessed statements and then we'll be done. Now, here's an invitation I'm going to give to you guys. So for the last year or so, we've been going through all this, and each night as we end, I've asked you if you've got questions or anything like that, and a few of you will ask questions or whatever, uh, and I'll try to answer those best I can. So oh, you've you got three weeks now, two weeks, this week, next week, two weeks. You've got two weeks, write down. This isn't a call it out loud, call your name, this person has this question, this person has this question. Write down all your questions. Bring your questions to me. I'm going to try to write them down. And if I get enough questions that people are wanting answered about things that, that we talked about you didn't understand or just things in general that has to do with end times of Revelation, I'll take that last, the very last study in Revelation will be kind of a QA and a for you guys. It'll be kind of a, hey, here's some questions people have had about Revelation as we've gone through or the end times that maybe I didn't explain well enough or... Maybe in my excitement, I just completely skipped over that part of the notes one night. I, I don't know. Any questions you may have, I, I know a lot of people don't like to talk out loud, so this is an opportunity to write them down, 
Call me, text me, email me. You guys know how to get a hold of me. But get those questions to me. And then after we finish the blessed statements in Revelation over the next two weeks, that last session, I'll try my best to answer those questions. Now, I am going to tell you this. I don't know all the answers to all your questions you may have sometimes. I don't. And so if I don't know, I'm going to tell you that. I don't know your answer. I couldn't find it, couldn't figure it out. Um, but give me your questions, and that last session will be a question and answer session. And then we're going to move on from Revelation. And the next thing we're going to do is we're going to look at the different religions in the world. Okay, that's going to be our next Bible study. So we're going to look at the different religions in the world. And what we're going to do is we're going to spend a couple of weeks on what we believe as Christians. And then we're going to look at what other people believe in their religions, and we're going to compare that to what we believe, and we're going to see where the differences are. It will not be a bashing session on other religions. That's not my intention. My intention is to show us and help us understand what we believe for a couple of weeks because we think we know what we believe, but do we always know what we believe? And then we're going to compare that to what other religions believe and see the difference. And everything is going to be based on the Word of God, not on opinions by others. So that's what's going to be after Revelation. I figured I'd let you go ahead and know what's next since we've been doing this for a year or longer. That Bible study will take about six weeks. And, and then we'll move on to some other things. So uh, let's close in prayer tonight. And then we'll get into our announcements and our Bible studies. But please, please, if you have questions, write them down. Give them to me. Text them to me. Email them to me. Whatever. And in that last session, we'll go through all those uh, questions. And I'll try to answer them the best I can for you as we do that. Let's close in prayer tonight. Heavenly Father, Lord, we do thank you for your word. Lord, I pray that as we've studied Revelation, Father, that we've had hope this whole time. Because, Lord, you are coming back for us one day. And, Father, you will return. You will get rid of all sin, all evil. And, Father, we will live in peace and harmony with you forever in your righteousness, Lord. And that is something to be thankful for and hopeful for, Lord. So help us remember that as we close out this study in Revelation. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.